When my son was in middle school, I went with him on a field trip to Chattanooga, Tennessee. I don't know if you've ever been to Chattanooga, Tennessee, but there's a lot to do and see there. It's a real nice place to go. There's this place called Lookout Mountain. Lookout Mountain, you stand in this one spot, you see seven different states. I think you can see like Arkansas, no, you can see Alabama, um, Kentucky, Georgia, Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, I think it is. And there's this marker there, it's got arrows pointing to each state. So if you look in that direction, you'll see that state. And, bes and beside each arrow, there's a number that tells you how many miles it is to that state. And then there's this place called Rock City. When I was young, I used to see these, these red bird houses with black tops on them, and it, it would say, Sea Rock City. And I never really knew what it was. So, finally got to go. There's shops there, there's restaurants there, and they still sell those same bird houses today. And there's a path you can go down and you walk through gardens and these huge rock formations. There's boulders. And there's some places that it's really narrow between the boulders and you have to squeeze through sideways. And you come out on the side of a mountain and you can just see for miles and miles over the other mountains. But there's this one place, my favorite place, it's called Ruby Falls. Ruby Falls is a, wa is a waterfall and it's 145 feet high. But the unique thing about Ruby Falls is that it's underground. So when you go to Ruby Falls, you have to get on an elevator. And it takes you underground, you get off in this cave, and you have to walk a little ways before you get to the falls. And your tour guide stops you there and he tells you some things about Ruby Falls. And he tells you, don't drink the water because it, it has magnesium in it. That's an active ingredient in milk of magnesia. So, <laughs> milk of magnesia has 1%, it has 14%. Uh, they tell you that they don't know where the, the water comes from, they don't know what the water source is. And um, they tell you when you're at the falls that you're as far underground as the Empire State Building is tall. And they also told us, and I don't know if they still do this today, but they told us they're going to turn out the lights on us. And that it would be darker than anything you've ever seen. They said, the darkness that you're used to usually has some light in it, but this is pitch black darkness. So we go in there and you can just barely see, and there's a little bit of light so that you can see where you're standing, and they turn out the lights. And let me tell you, it is dark. You can't see the hand in front of your face, you can't see anybody around you. It's kind of disorienting. The only thing you can do is you can hear the waterfalls, it's the roar of the waterfalls. You can feel a little mist on your face and you can feel the turbulent air swirling around you. And then they turn on the music and lights start flashing. And then you can see the waterfalls and it's beautiful. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Not the waterfalls, but that darkness. Light and darkness. That's a... That's a subject in the Bible that goes from Genesis to Revelation, from cover to cover. And I got to thinking, if, if I'm going to talk about light and darkness, I probably need to define what light and darkness is. So I look on Google, what is light? And there's no good definition for light. I mean, it's, it's a complicated thing. They were all about like this. This is the first one I came upon. It says, what is light? Light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum which ranges from radio waves to gamma rays. Electromagnetic radiation waves, as their name suggests, are fluctuations of electric and magnetic fields which can transport energy from one location to another. Visible light is not inherently different from the other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum with the exception that a human eye can detect visible waves. 
Electromagnetic radiation can also be described in terms of a stream of photons, which are massless particles, each traveling with wave-like properties at the speed of light. A photon is the smallest quantity or quantum of energy which can be transported, and it was the realization that light traveled in discrete quanta that was the origins for quantum theory. That did me no good. I'm sure there's some of you that's probably said, that's exactly what I would have said. But I got to think, well, how am I going to describe light? When maybe that's what I should do, describe it. Maybe I should tell what the characteristics of light is. What does light do? Well, light, let's see if I can get this to work. What is light? Light illuminates. Light illuminates everything around us so that we can interact with our world. It illuminates our path. It illuminates God's creation so that we can see it and enjoy it. Light shines. Any light source doesn't contain that light within itself and hold it there. No, light shines forth from that light source. It radiates out and illuminates the world. Light is energy. We've all seen these houses with, with these solar panels on it and, and they have solar cells in there and it captures the light, converts it into electricity so that that house can use electricity. You know, I've seen solar panels with that, that are covering cars. And, and these are the little bitty electric cars that, that can go just on sunlight. And, you know, we have calculators that have, have the solar cells in them and they don't need batteries. Light is energy. Light sustains life. The sun shines down on the earth and the leaves from the plants catch that light and convert it into an energy so that it can grow. And then animals eat those plants. We eat those plants and we eat the animals that eat those plants. So light sustains life. Light supplies heat. Sometimes it's good to go out in the sun and just, just feel the heat from the sun. And I know we've all opened up our curtains at times when it's the winter time and let the sun shine in and it helps heat our house. So that's kind of an idea of what light is. So what is darkness? Darkness is a little easier to explain because darkness is just an absence of light. God created light on the first day of creation. But before He created light, there was darkness. It, he didn't create that darkness, it just was. There's other things in our world that work kind of the same way, like heat and cold. What is cold? Cold's kind of relative. Ask any married couple. You know, <laughs> cold is just a relative thing, but really, cold is just the absence of heat. Heat is energy. We can't really add cold to something. All we can do is take that heat away. How about sin? And you may say, oh, I can name sins. And, and, and you can. But sin really, when you get down to it, is, is an absence of righteousness. You take away righteousness and you're left with sin. How about pride? Is that not just an absence of humility? So that's, that's an idea of what, what darkness is. It's an absence of light. But that's physical light and darkness. What about biblical light and darkness? What is biblical light? Well, the Bible speaks of two kinds of light. You have physical light and you have light used in a metaphoric way. But the funny thing is, is usually when it's talking about a physical light, it also has a metaphoric meaning behind it too. So let's look at a few examples from the Bible to find out what light is. Genesis 1-3 says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God created light. And the funny thing to me about it is, he created light before He created any source of light. 
before, I think it was on day four of the creation that he, he created the sun and the stars. But before that, there was no source of light. So I guess he was the source of light. David, in Psalms 27, 1 said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? So God is light. That's, that's the thing you hear th all throughout the Bible. God is light. Also in Psalm 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The Word of God, that is light to us. That enlightens us and it shows us how we should go. The Word of God is light. Jesus is light. John says in, in chapter 1 that Jesus is light. He says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. John says that Jesus was the light. We see in Matthew 5 14 that Jesus said that you are the light. That's what we're to be. We're to be the light. Jesus said, you are the light. In 1 John 1, 7 it says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sins. We are to walk in the light as He is in the light. So that's kind of an idea of what biblical light is, but what is biblical darkness? We'll go back to our original definition. It's the absence of light. It's the absence of everything we just talked about. If you don't have that, then you are in darkness. Biblical darkness is a separation from God. 1 John 1.5 says that God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If you're walking in darkness, then you're not with God because God is light. They're separate. They're opposites. You cannot be in the light and in the darkness at the same time. Sin is darkness. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. John 3, 19 through 20. So now we kind of have an idea of what physical light and darkness is. We have an idea of what biblical light and darkness is. Now, look at some examples where the Bible talks about light and darkness. In the creation, first day of creation, Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God separated or divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So it starts out from the very beginning talking about light and darkness. 
And this is a theme that goes all the way through Revelation. Another one let's look at is Egypt's plague of darkness in Exodus 10. Exodus 10 talks about two plagues. It talks about the eighth plague, the plague of locusts. And it also talks about the ninth plague, the plague of darkness. You see, the Egyptians, they worshipped the sun god Ra. That was the sun god. He was the god of light, warmth, and, and life. Supposedly, he had created life. The funny thing is, is the Hebrew word Ra means evil. But God was going to show them that their God of light, their sun God, was no match for him. God told Moses, stretch your hand towards heaven. And darkness fell on the face of Egypt. And the darkness was so great, it says that it could be felt. It says that no one could move. Can you imagine it being so dark that you can't even move? Because there was no source of light in the land. They couldn't see to even go anywhere. Wherever you were, that's where you stayed for three days. But the Hebrews, they had light. You see, God was leading them. God was with them. They had light. There they were in the middle of all this darkness, and they had light. It's kind of like us. When we go out into the world, we're light in a world of darkness. But then after that, you know, there was the tenth plague, the plague of the death of the firstborn, and Pharaoh's son died. And Pharaoh had had enough, and he told him, get out, take all your stuff. So they did. They got all their stuff, and they left Egypt. And they headed out, and Pharaoh got to thinking, I shouldn't have done that. So he says to his army, go get them. So the Egyptian army starts chasing them, and the children of Israel had come to a place where there was water on one side, the Red Sea, and there was the cliffs of the mountain on the other. The only way out was the way they came in, and the Egyptian army was blocking that way. So God parted the Dead Sea, I mean the Red Sea, and they went across on dry land. And then the Egyptians followed them in. God destroyed them in the water. Isn't that a beautiful picture of baptism? You see, Egypt is almost always used as a picture of sin, as a picture of evil. And they were destroyed in the water. But after that, in the 13th chapter, God led the people by a pillar of fire, I mean by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. It says, And the Lord went before them by day and a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. You see, they were never in darkness. The light was with them because God was with them. Now let's go to the crucifixion. Matthew 27, 45, Mark 15, 33, and Luke 23, 44 all tells about this account. Our Lord and Savior was being crucified. They drove spikes through His hands and His feet. They raised Him up on the cross. People would come by and they would hurl insults at Him. And they would mock Him. Even the two thieves that were being crucified with Him, they were mocking Him. Jesus hung there for six hours. He hung there from around 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. Around noon at 12 o'clock, darkness fell on the land. And you could say that was truly a dark time. Jesus bore our sins on that cross. My sin and your sin. 
the sins of the world. It seems like God had turned His back on Jesus. He was the light of the world. But He took our sins upon Himself. And Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a few examples from the Bible. Now let's look at walking in the light. How do we walk in the light? Let's look at 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. It says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we walk in the light. He tells us exactly how we're supposed to walk in the light. He says, with all diligent, you have to be diligent about this. And he says, to add to your faith virtue, to your virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self control, to self control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. That's how we're to do it. Let's also look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such thing as, against such there is no law and those who are Christ I'm going a little bit too far here <laughs> but it tells us what the fruit of the spirit is if we're walking in the light these are the things that we're going to exhibit in our life Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. It says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth but what is good for, good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Well, that says a lot. It says we're not to be angry in our sin. I mean, not to be... Uh, it says to be angry and do not sin. It says to speak truth with your brother and your neighbor. Do not steal. Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. It says, let all bitterness, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. 
Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Boy, that, uh, that sounds like our world around us, don't it? Those are the things you see on TV every day. And people think nothing about it. So... You may, uh, you may say, Chris, I'm walking in darkness. I need to walk in the light. Or you may say, I'm doing pretty good compared to most people, but who are you comparing yourself to? Don't compare yourself to the darkness. The light is the standard. God, Jesus, the Word of God. You may say, Chris, I don't drink, smoke, cuss, or chew, and I don't go with girls who do. And that's pretty good, but think about this. Are we getting desensitized to sin? Let me give you a little example. Horses are scared of everything. I'm going to give you a little horse example. <laughs> so horses are scared of everything, and you have to desensitize them. <coughs> My daughter's got a horse and is scared of butterflies. And it thinks that butterfly is going to eat it alive. Well, what you have to do is you have to put that horse in a round pen. You get in that round pen with it. You take a rope and you start swinging that rope. He has nowhere to go except around the round pen. And you start swinging that rope and he will run and run and run. Then you have to do the other side. Because you might desensitize a horse on one side. doesn't mean he's desensitized on the other side. So you got to do it the other way too. And you keep working with him and you work with him. And he'll get tired. And you got to stop every now and then and see what he does. When he turns and faces you, you can go over there and you can and rub his nose because he's given up. You can take that rope and let him smell of it. You can rub it on his side. Then you've got to go back again and start swinging that rope. And you keep doing that over and over and over until he gives up. And you have to desensitize them to all kinds of things. Paper bags or, or plastic bags. They're terrified of plastic bags because they make noise. So, you know, sooner or later you, you keep working with that plastic bag and you can rub it all over him. He won't even care. Now think about this. <clears throat> the world's full of darkness. That last verse that we read listed just about everything we see in the world today. And most of us are piping that stuff into our houses, on TV, on the internet, on our phones. We've gotten so used to it. Years ago, that stuff wouldn't have ever been allowed. But we get entertainment out of it now. We don't think a thing about it. That's just, that's just the way things are. But how would God feel about us getting in entertainment out of something like that? In James, it says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world.
If you've got sin in your life, you need to talk to somebody about it. Or if you want to confess a sin, if don't go to the world. Go to somebody here or come forward tonight. Talk to a Christian because we love you. We want the best for you. We want to we want to help you. They won't understand. They won't, they won't know how to give you good advice. If you have any need, if you're living in darkness and you want to live in the light, you've never put on Jesus in baptism, this would be a great time to do it. And you can come forward as we stand and sing. Just as I have.